Um, we are glad to be here today. Thank you for this opportunity. And today we are talking about virtual reality and visual arts. And uh, let me introduce uh, a very special guest who I'm a uh, uh, fan of. Uh, it's uh, Tina uh, Sauerlander. Uh, she's an uh, art historian, curator, uh, speaker, and a writer based in Berlin. Uh, she focuses on the uh, impact of the digital and uh, internet uh, on individual environments and society, as well as uh, on virtual reality and visual arts. Uh, she's artistic director of the VR Art Prize. Uh, with her independent exhibitions platform, Peer to Space, uh, she has been curating and organizing international group shows since uh, 2010. Um, the Unframed World, Virtual Reality as Artistic Medium uh, for the 21st Century. Uh, she's a co-founder of Radiance VR, an international online uh, platform and research database for virtual reality experiences in virtual arts. She's the founder of Saloon, an international network uh, for women working in art. Uh, she gave uh, talks on virtual reality and arts in lots of uh, international events. And uh, without further ado, uh, Tina uh, Sauerlander. Thank you so much, Nikita, for this kind introduction. Thank you so much, Anastasia and everyone at Linoleum Fest for inviting me. Thank you for Goethe Institute for the support. I'm really happy and I'm honored to speak today. And I'm really looking forward to share some uh, insights in virtual reality and visual arts with you today. And yeah, it will be a broad approach. I will tell you about the history of VR, about the history of VR and art, and then also, of course, about contemporary forms uh, art forms in virtual reality or with different kinds of virtual reality. Yeah, and so it will be about 40, 40, 40 to 45 minutes and I will get just started right away. And um, the first part will be an introductory part on the history of virtual reality. And as you may know already is the, the wish for immersion uh, of humankind is very, is a very big part of humankind itself and always existed, you know, already with the Egyptian pyramids and how they designed their uh, chambers in the pyramids. Also the invention of the central perspective uh, in European uh, painting you know, how to create illusionary 3D spaces on a 2D surface is very much part of the history of immersion and trying to create immersive experiences for the viewer. And of course, this goes on and on until today, um, where we have things like projection domes or really big panoramic views, or of course, 3D cinema and things like that. And yeah, the headset itself is also not such a new thing. It basically exists since, uh, you know, with the invention of photography, they already invented this device, the stereoscope, where you have uh, the same image, but slightly um, juxtaposed so that you can create the illusion of the 3D effect in the visuals. And this uh, device today functions as it functions 160 years ago or 180 years ago, it's still the same same idea and people still use it and uh, yeah the idea of um, walk, uh, seeing a virtual world through spectacles through glasses is also not a new one it exists for example here in this um, science fiction novel Pygmalion's uh, Spectacles by Stanley Weinbaum and you could also see this world you could interact this in this world in this novel and it also I think has some uh, smell in it and so it's really about yeah transitioning to the other world and this idea is also around quite a long time yeah but to really make these ideas happen we they had to wait a little longer until the um, late seven fifth 1950s, 70s, where it started. And one of my favorite devices is the Sensorama. It only existed in one piece. There's only one prototype. But uh, Martin Helig invented this device where you sit on the chair and where you watch, um, have the surrounded view and also stereo sound in, um, in the device. And so you see there are different films for it. One is this um, car race. 
And uh, if you experience it in this device, this, your seat will vibrate. You will also have the smell of cars with it. You have emotion, so, uh, you have the sound with it. So it was a really um, immersive experience already. Yeah, and Martin, he like uh, continued to, to develop for virtual reality and he also invented the first uh, headset where you could see uh, 3D images, moving 3D images. So before that, 3D was mostly, um, uh, or like the stereoscope, as you know, well, were uh, static images. And with this headset, you could also see videos in 3D on a headset. And um, a very important invention is the so-called Sword of Damocles from 1968 and this headset, which is actually an AR headset, you can see the small sphere on a small cube on the side. This is how the things uh, would look like. So it's very basic images. But the great thing is that this headset was connected to, to a computer, which means that you could generate live imagery. Uh, so, and that was of course, it was of course really important also for virtual reality. And then the next years, uh, not so much happened in developing virtual reality. So there is a new wave in, in the eighties, uh, where the technology became more advanced. And for example, Eric Howlett developed a headset but much more famous is the iPhone and the data glove, which was uh, created by the company VPL Research. That's the company of Javan Lanier, one of the VR pioneers and enthusiasts in the, in the 80s. And this headset was kind of expensive, $9,000 <laughs> plus a good computer. So it was nothing that you could just buy on the market. It was um, some, something that was used in science but also something that was used in um, a Kate gaming center. So in public gaming centers, you could also, when you were lucky, find this kind of a headset. And for the commercial use, there were some game industry participants like Sega or uh, Forte who tried to release uh, VR headsets for, you know, the, um, the market to commercialize it, but also aesthetic wise, it was really, not so good and was really also technology wise, um, not very advanced. So for example, the, uh, the uh, VFX one by four to which you see here, the display was really small. Actually, it wasn't really like immersive or so. And also the virtual bar boy by Nintendo is also like an infamous uh, early VR headset, which caused nausea for the users <laughs> usually. And you can see that the graphics is also very, um, simply done. And um, yeah, now fast forwarding 20 years. <laughs> so that we are uh, in, in today's uh, VR and you can already see here in the comparison that the whole imagery is much more complex, much more detailed. And yeah, so the industry really made big steps technology wise so that VR now is used much more widely than in the 90s. And yeah, here two headsets, the first one, Oculus Rift, um, yeah, they were the first to, to really enter the market and to start developing new headsets and Vive came um, soon after that actually. And these are still the two most used um, headset types besides the Oculus Quest, but I will get to that later or actually right now. <laughs> so uh, today you would use typically different forms of VR headsets. So one is the PC VR with the HTC Vive or the Oculus Rift headsets, which we just saw, but just updated versions. And you would have to connect it to a really powerful computer. So that's, that would generate the best VR experience you have. And then the most simple uh, access would be mobile VR, where you have um, the simple glasses or cardboard and you use your phone with it. But that's also, in my opinion, kind of dead right now. So because since we have the new standalone headset since um, one year or so, or maybe two years, um, these are much more easier to use. So there's, for example, Oculus um, Go and Oculus Quest, which uh, you can see here. And standalone means that you don't need to install anything um, else in your space. No. Uh, no, and you also don't need a computer. You don't need any other device. You just, um, yeah, switch it on and you can use it. You can dive right in, go to the store, download games and whatever. And yeah, immerse yourself in virtual reality. And artists today mostly work with PC VR or now also with the Oculus Quest, actually. And 
and uh, now I would like to speak a little about virtual reality in the arts and also want to start with the history of VR and one important part uh, are immersive interactive installations. Um, because um, virtual reality does not necessarily mean that you enter the virtual world with a headset, but it could also be, there are also different kinds of entering a virtual world. And these interactive installations I will introduce you to now. Um, so you're all standing in front of a big screen of a big projection of the digital world, and then you can interact with it in different ways while being in the physical space. And mm, one of the first um, installations over that time is Miron Kruger's uh, video place. And that was pretty cool because you would be standing in the space and there would be a camera recording your movements and then transport this directly to the virtual world. This you can see in the two images on the left side. But in addition, you could install the same devices in two different places, for example, in New York and Los Angeles. And you could be with another person from Los Angeles or from somewhere else in the world at the same time on the same screen, as you can see on the right side of this slide, of this uh, sheet here, slide here. And so you could interact with people in the digital world, which are totally um, off-site and somewhere else in the world. And that was 1974, and I, I think it's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, then another really famous installation is Jeffrey Shaw's Legible City. And there you would sit on a bike. And by interacting with this bike, you would actually drive through virtual worlds, which are here uh, designed with uh, big letters and fonts and um, sentences and different kinds of writing. There's this uh, small image on the left where you can see it from a bird's eye view. And yeah, so you could just drive through the big uh, words and scenes and streets. And yeah, the left side where you can read Trump, that's um, obviously London. Uh, London. <laughs> it's obviously um, New York. And uh, then also the artists Christa Sommerer and Laurent Mignon Yu work a lot with interactive um, installations. And that's one of my favorite also where you would stand in front of the um, of the screen and the cameras would also record your movements and with the movements you could then activate the plant growing the digital plant growing in the virtual world and uh, Luc Corchen landscape one he is um, Luc Corchen is Canadian VR pioneer also or pioneer also of immersive installations and here you would stand in a museum space right in the middle of these big screens and in the nearby park in uh, Montreal, there would be a device with um, microphones and the people would just talk into the microphones and you could talk to the people in the park and they could talk um, with you also. And then there is another device, it's called the CAVE, CAVE Automatic Virtual Environment. And such a cave is basically a, a cube. It's three meters by three meters by three meters. And all the walls and also the floor is um, are projection surfaces. So the, um, the virtual world would be projected on these surfaces. And you would stand right in the middle. You could also stand with several people in there. And you would wear shutter glasses, which would create a 3D illusion while standing in the space. And how this looks in art, I will show you here with this example, Margaret Dolinsky and Chris Simish, uh, Dream Girls. And yeah, you can see, see it here a little. And yeah, the two artists um, created the, a, a dreamlike environment. They wanted to make like a surreal la uh, landscape or escape, which is labyrinthic. It's supposed to be like um, a journey into your unfamiliar um, psyche that was really important for them. Yeah, and you can see with the controllers, you can also shift um, shift the imagery with it while being in the cave. And uh, that's also a cave project by Austrian artist Peter Kogler. I don't have a video, unfortunately, but you would stand also again in the space and then all these ants, they would just walk past you and would walk in through into the tunnel. And I like that so much because it refers to an earlier installation by Peter Kogler, which he did um, for the documentary in Kassel, 
in Germany in uh, like seven years earlier in 1992, where you can see he also tried to create this immersive um, idea, but in, in an analog uh, way, also using the ants and all of the ideas of the tunnels and phase out. And um, yeah, so this have been the immersive installation, but also um, the art, art with the headsets has been around since the late 80s actually. Uh, we saw the iPhone already, that's a headset that most of the artists um, used at that time. So did Nicole Stenger with her interactive virtual reality mo uh, movie Angels. And um, you can see here that you could also interact with that. Um, you, there is this carousel and you would pick one of the hearts and then you enter the different worlds. And I have a um, video for you now with, uh, with sound because the sound, a classical music piece, it's also really beautiful. <laughs> you could get an impression, a more immersive one maybe with the sound. And yeah, one thing about these early VR works from the 80s or early 90s is that most of the works unfortunately um, got lost because, um, you know, back then the computers were much more bigger and you couldn't easily transport digital files or send digital files. So um, many works are lost. For example, this beautiful work, um, Home of the Brain by Monika Fleischmann and Wolfgang Strauss, where you would actually meet um, different media theorists and um, you could dive in the world and they tell, will tell you their opinion on um, new media. So, but there are only documentations available, unfortunately. And also that uh, perceptual arena was a nice piece where you could, um, with your movements, you would actually create some virtual clay, so some virtual material, and then you could form it in um, virtual reality and sculpt, sculpt with that. That's also a really great work. And yeah, um, virtual reality back then was actually already exhibited at the Guggenheim Museum in New York in 1993, where um, Jenny Holzer showed her two VR works, Cupids and um, Bosnia. And um, so here you would float around um, in this tunnel and you would encounter these heads and some of them would talk to you or others would just flee from you. It's, um, it's uh, very different. And what's interesting also about this exhibition at Guggenheim is that it was not only an art exhibition, but it also included other experiences. For example, a visualization of the stock market of New York, and uh, I so saw about the like um, the graphs. The co I don't know how to say the courses. No, I, I'm liking English word. Not that important. Or also like a musical piece was in that um, in that show. And maybe you have already encountered Chad Davis's Osmose, Osmosi. That's a very famous VR piece of the 90s, and that's usually quoted when it's about VR in the 90s. And the cool thing and why it is so special is because the user would wear a motion tracking vest. So a vest which would um, kind of record your, your breath and your movements while breathing. And it would transfer it into the virtual reality. So you would have kind of an experience like um, diving and you could go down and up uh, with your own, with the movements of your own breath, which is, yeah, I think it's pretty cool. And many people who experienced this, they also told me that this was definitely one of the best VR experiences they ever had, despite the new technology we have today. Still, they think that's one of the best. So, but also unfortunately, this is not really easy to recreate. So finally, we will uh, diving into VR today. And there are of course also many different ways of um, using VR in art. 
today. And the first thing I want to show you are VR exhibitions and virtual reality. So these would all be hall exhibitions that you could um, see or experience via different devices you would use. And um, there is um, the first look, Artists VR. That's an app that's also in the App Store um, of, the, of uh, Google and iPhone and everything. And you can download this app. And if you have a um, VR headset, like a cardboard at home where you could put in your phone, you can then experience all the artworks uh, in this headset. And um, then you also have the Digital Museum of Digital Art by Alfredo Salazar-Caro and William Robertson. And these two, they conceived the whole museum building in virtual reality. You can see it on the left upper image. And um, you would, in the VR experience, you would just start in front of the building, you would enter the building, and then you could move up uh, different pyramids in the building. You see this on the lower left image, the, the green with the green lights. And they would guide you to the different experiences, like for example, by Jacoby Satterwhite or by Claudia Hart. And um, I think there are like four or five editions now already, and you can download them on from the website and you can see them, I think, on the Oculus Rift also at home, if you like. And uh, that's another exhibition, Nausea, which was curated by Philip Hausmeier in 2016. And uh, what's interesting here, I mean, obviously, beside the artworks, is that you would have different portals which you could open with your Vive controllers to enter um, the different artworks. And um, then uh, Manuel Rosner, who is a um, uh, German Bay, uh, uh, designer and artist here in Germany, in Berlin. He, he is specialized in designing different um, museum spaces also, and he designed, for example, Unreal, which is the virtual exhibition space of the NRW Forum in Düsseldorf. And here you see it's the same principle. You could walk up the stairs and then you would enter the the different the spheres, as you can see the blue spheres, to then see the different VR artworks. And here you also have an idea how the how the museum would install it. In this case, you know, on the image on the right side, you, they would just have different computers and headsets hanging from the ceiling and a color coded wall. And once you would put on the headset, you would be in the same color coded wall system. And from there on, you could step um, up the stairs and see the works. Yeah, that's another um, museum Manuel designed, and I will just show you uh, the exhibition from the uh, Cube. The first exhibition where you have a work by Bunsen Bowinkel, a sculpture there you, which you can climb up. It's like five meters high and you can just climb up. And another experience, for example, from Martina Manigan, where you will enter the space and encounter the different mask-like heads of the artists who would just be reproducing themselves. Or Chiara Passa, she makes wonderful abstract sculptures in virtual reality. They would float and they would move around and they would constantly also change the texture of the surface, which you unfortunately can't see here because, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a, um, a still here. And um, then there is um, a kind of um, new thing that appeared uh, recently, and that's um, WebVR, or let's namely <laughs> call it uh, Mozilla Hubs, which is a new platform, uh, which uh, is WebVR that works for a VR headset, but also for a browser. So you could access the same world with a browser or a headset. And it's open source, and you can build your own rooms and exhibitions. And uh, you don't need so much programming skills. There are many 3D models and things you can just use. Um, yeah, unless you want to create your own 3D content, then of course <laughs> you need have to have more knowledge. But it's it's a tool which is really really accessible for creators who are not so familiar with um, 3D uh, generating own 3D content and which um, that's a way of how artists also can create VR spaces. And that's um, a really great tool. And I just got two examples for you. One is uh, an exhibition, Home, by uh, Martina Marzian. And you would just enter on screen. That's also a screen recording, so you can easily see it on screen. 
go in and move around and see see the space or also here um, that's a space by again the artist Martina Menegon where you could um, enter and just fly <laughs> through um, all the the hands the models of the hands and that's to see this in a VR headset I really recommend that it's pretty pretty cool so yeah you can already see you have lots of possibilities to design such a space on Mozilla hubs so now that's more or less the last chapter I have we are exhibitions in the physical space and that's what I uh, do as a curator or did in the past uh, two three years um, to create physical shows with VR and find ways to um, embed VR in in the exhibitions and um, by doing this so one of the most important things is um, that uh, Irani Vegara, who is a curator from Montreal, and I, we de developed an exhibition series we call Critical Approaches in Virtual Reality Art. And uh, for us, it was really important to um, focus on critical VR, as we call it, because we figured that, you know, there are many VR experiences out there, and it's often hard to distinguish if it's entertainment, if it's game, if it's visual art or whatever, you know, there are just many forms, but you would all access them with the, with the same device. And we wanted to focus on um, visual artists who work with the medium and um, also visual artists who critically engage with the medium, its possibilities, and also um, critically engage with a social or societal aspects in, with this medium. And yeah, we did a shows in Toronto and Washington, in New York and in Barcelona so far. And I would like to introduce you to um, some of the shows, especially the show Speculative Cultures, which we did last year at uh, New School Parsons um, in New York. And um, in this show, we invited artists from different countries, from different continent, so to say with different perspectives on culture um, to the show and all of the artists already had VR works in which they deal with different no notions of culture. So for example, they would deal with the culture of the ancestors and visualize it in virtual reality. This is for example, what uh, Scott Benesina Bandan did in the image left, you see his installation. He is a First Nation artist um, from Canada and he dealt yeah, with the history of his ancestors. Or um, Marishan Alayari, she, um, she uh, occupies herself with um, ancient mythologies or stories from, um, from Iran and especially with the stories of female um, protagonists or goddesses in these stories and she finds ways to translate it into today or translate these stories into virtual reality and um, that's what her work is about and Matthias Bonacci uh, an Argentinian artist who lives in um, who lives here in um, Germany he um, is very much interested in lucid dreaming so um, I don't know if you know it, but if you want to do lucid dreaming, you watch the palm of your hands before you go to, to sleep for a certain amount of time. And this will help you later to be awake in your dreams if you practice this for a while. And so in this whole world, you interact with your hands a lot. You have hand tracking and you would enter different worlds also with the hands and would be able to touch different ideas. And so what's very interesting about this show is that um, once you have these all in the space, you would see that all these different cultures from different continents, maybe from different times, they are all interconnected by our symbols, you know, that are used in, in different cultures. For example, shamanism, shamanistic symbols are, can be find, found in China, but also like in Argentina and around the world or images or forms of sacred geometry as Scott uses them, you would also find in um, other ancient cultures or cultures in general. So you could see, you could feel in the space how cultures are actually very much interconnected also. And okay, time-wise I have to rush a bit, but I will just also quickly introduce you to um, this piece, which was also in the show. And so um, the artist, Erin Cole and Jamie Martinez, they are really fascinated with Egyptian, ancient Egyptian culture 
And there is this book, it's called Book of the Dead, and it describes the journey to the afterlife. And in ancient Egypt, this was a, was a thing that actually was just there for, for rich people who had access to this and had would, would have been able to have a good transition to afterlife. But now uh, in the digital version that two artists created, everyone um, has the chance to um, to experience this journey. And um, you can see the installation, you have this triangular shape. And so you would enter through the fabric into the transition zone to take on um, this journey. And you would also encounter Anubis, who is the um, Egyptian god of uh, death rituals. And um, they also included in their installation an augmented reality part, which I find really beautiful. They made um, sculptures of pages of the Book of the Dead and then animated them in augmented um, reality, which was also part of the show. And another show uh, we did was um, Speculative Species, which we also did last year. On, and this um, deals with, um, yeah, let's say, animals or different ways of humans deal with animals. And Lara Torrance, um, which is the first image on the left side, she um, rebuilt almost distinct animals from New England in like this glass, beautiful greenish glass shapes and put them back into to the landscape there. And uh, Juan Le Park, he criticizes or um, he, exag he exaggerates our uh, meat consume actually. So what he did is he was building a temple out of meat, out of sausages, like chorizo, like salami, like all kinds of sausages and building like you see this man in there. He's also built of like uh, sausages or the surface of sausages. And yeah, you could dive right in and um, see see the pigs on a carousel in many different ways. It's really um, a really crazy work. But um, yeah, also should show us how crazy we are about um, meat and also should, you know, be critically engaging with our meat consumption. And also Jacob Kutzstensen, he reanimated, that's the title of his work, an instinct bird in his VR work. And yeah, the last work by Bianca Kennedy and Swan Collective, I want to show you more in detail. Um, here you can see that you are being swallowed. You would be the bark and you would be being swallowed by this man. And um, yeah, this bark um, uh, later on protests because humans would eat many, many barks to um, to have enough, to eat enough um, protein, so for nutrition. And then this bark says, hey guys, instead of eating millions of uh, barks, uh, you can just eat one whale and you would have the same amount of uh, proteins, but you would be just killing one living entity instead of millions. And yeah, that's the story. And of course the two get into a fight uh, in the end. And uh, yeah, we install it in the space with this huge um, print of the bug and the whale um, fighting. So that's not AR that has really been um, in the in the space. And that's um, that's um, installation idea that Felix, uh, the artist of Swan Collective or the Swan Collective in general, also used before in this show, which also I curated at the Goethe Institute in Toronto. Um, you can see on the top an image of the inside VR with all the, the, light, the arms that hold uh, the phones and make likes like this. And then on the images on the down, or the lower images, you see how we installed all these hands in the real space. And again, these are not, uh, not AR hands. They have been really physically there in the space hung from the, from the ceiling. Yeah, and then uh, the Unframed World, that was actually the first big virtual reality show I curated back in 2017 at the House of Electronic Arts in Basel in Switzerland. And um, back then um, I decided to speak about how the artists using virtual reality would also discuss virtual reality with real life elements. So back then many artists dealt with how 
how um, elements or sculptures or entities would work in real life or and how they would function in virtual reality. And um, for example, one work was by Martha Hipley, which you can see on the left. And there you would have to take a test on a computer screen. And then you could see uh, the result of your test, uh, which would be your perfect boyfriend uh, in the headset. And uh, um, you can see the headset, which we are wearing, the pink and the blue one. And um, also the headset, you can see it has like a device around it. It's uh, like a silicon device that would actually vibrate and heat up and is shaped like a, like a head. It has like kind of ears. So you could basically hold the head of your boyfriend in your hand while watching him in virtual reality. Pretty cool work. And also the artist uh, Rachel Rosen made a really great work, which is called Just a Nose. And in real life, you would encounter her paintings on the wall. And then in VR, you would meet um, a translation of these paintings into the digital realm, which you can see on a little movie below. And um, in the work of Lia Lin, you would sit in a circle of chairs and in the VR world, you would then encounter seven times just sitting around you, Dina, which is a character that Lia Lin invented. She performs all of them by herself. And uh, Dina would tell you, she's from the future actually, and she would tell you how she sees the world today and would highly criticize our reproduction system. And um, yeah, another work of the show um, is by Bunsen and Bobinkel, and they created the scaffolding in real life. And um, with all different elements, you can see which also occur in virtual reality. And this is like a short excerpt of the virtual reality world of uh, Mer Mercury, as the piece called. And you will see elements that look very real, like this birch tree, but you will also see elements that are look, don't like look don't look real at all. And um, for example, these f uh, floating spheres, obviously. And um, they made two really interesting things in their work to um, talk about the interaction between the real life and uh, uh, virtual life. And the first thing is that on the scaffolding, you saw on the first slide, uh, they put cameras and they would record you while you are in VR. And at some point in a virtual reality experience, you would encounter yourself on the huge iPad hanging above you while you are in virtual reality. Uh, you can see this on the left, um, left image. And on the right side, you see in the middle, uh, this hand, the sculpture of a hand. And in the middle of it, there is a button and it's also attached to the scaffolding. And uh, once you press this button, you would be able to control the day and night cycle in the VR experience. So you could basically play God from the outside. You could press this button and it would go dark and light again very quickly in the experience for the user who's in there. Yeah, and um, so, um, after curating this first show, The Unfamed World, um, I discovered that it's not that easy actually to find uh, VR experiences by artists and there is no place to really look them up, you know. It, the, all the documentations were scattered on different sites on the internet. It was really badly documented and then uh, Philip Hausmeier, my colleague, and I, we decided to create a platform for this, which is called Radiance. And it's an international research platform for VR experiences in visual art. So it's basically a kind of a safe space for VR and visual arts. And it's also a data database for curators to um, research virtual reality artworks and all the documentations of it. And yeah, now we have at the moment 100, 162 VR artwork documentations on our site by 153 artists from 34 countries. And of course we are growing steadily. So we exist since end of 2017, so almost uh, three years, I think. Yeah, and, um, uh, and we still 
our goals are still to create accessibility and visibility for VR art and also to, you know, help curators who are afraid or shy to show VR art in, in the exhibitions to help them um, include VR in, in their shows also. And that's why we collaborate a lot with curators, art institutions, media festivals and so on. And another important part for us is also to raise awareness for the topic of history and of VR and visual arts. And yeah, this is, you know, just an um, example of how the uh, documentation site would look like. You would have a text and images, a video walkthrough of each work, which is really helpful. And you can also search by categories on our website, you know, for example, here, nature, landscape, parallel worlds, water, you would also find human body, feminism, um, abstract languages, many different categories on our website. And here I want to show you some corporations we had in the last years, for example, with Toronto New Bay Festival, uh, with the Locarno Film Festival, where we showed um, House of Haraway um, by Seamus Gallagher, Lee Allen, uh, we co-presented co Lee Allen's installation at the Sex Tech Conference in Berlin, Trinity Sphere Video in Toronto is a great partner of ours and we presented works of our artists in their app. Um, Creative Tech, we core contemporary synthesis gallery, really great partners we have or had over, over the years, obviously. And yeah, we still keep adding to this and still keep keep working on creating more accessibility for virtual reality and more visibility for VR art with yeah, all the shows and our, our platform, everything, what we do. Yeah, so that's it from my side. Thank you so much for listening so far. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. Very interesting lecture. And, um, I have several questions if you um, allow and since uh, we're in the context of uh, in in the context of the uh, animation uh, festival, uh, just interesting. Do you have like favorite animated VR art, or maybe some that you want to highlight somehow? I think um, there's this uh, experience Animalia Zoom, which I just showed, and you're totally right. I completely forgot to tell you how it was made. And it is a totally animated piece. So um, all the visuals you saw have been basically made by hand, physically by the artist. So the background for paintings and also the uh, the bark and the veil are actually models that the artist created in real life, uh, out of real clay, out of real materials, and then scanned them, rigged them, and animated them in um, word for virtual reality. And that's, yeah, I love that work a lot. And I think it's pretty, pretty well done. So, yeah. Regarding this different techni techniques of animation and drawing, like the these popular applications like Tilt the Brush or Gravity Sketch when you can draw. And um, it's, um, I found it as like a, um, specific genre and do you think it's really works well in the VR art scene or it's something different? Uh, no, I think it's it's really a huge part of, of the virtual reality art scene. I, maybe that's true, I didn't introduce a work that is made with tilt brush. I should totally include it next time in my talk because they are really, really great ones. And you can, of course, see them, see them on Radiance. For example, Tamiko Thiel's Land of Cloud or uh, Ora Rubens Invasive Species Museum. And you will see there that you can create, create a very different aesthetics in, um, in virtual reality when you do not use 3D models, but uh, paint your own content. And um, I think it's a really important part of the VR world. And, you know, I know it's very static maybe sometimes, but the artists creatively use it and um, find their own ways. For example, in Tami Thiel's Land of Cloud, you really physically, you, you have to go to the persons, there are like cloudy persons lying on the ground and standing, and you have to go there. You ca can also, you cannot um, beam yourself there. You really have to physically go there and go close to them and listen to what they are saying. So you have a very, very special way of interacting with them, which you even maybe wouldn't think of creating such experience when you know you could just, you know, be there with the controller. So you can make very special works with it. 
I see. And we have a question from the audience. Uh, Odmini Pijou, if I'm uh, pronouncing correct, asking, well, first of all, um, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, what is the future of VR art? How different do you think it will be then compared to what we have today in five years or so? <laughs> yeah, that's a complex question. So I, um, so comparing to the 90s where we already had VR and VR art, we see that it didn't, you know, work out. It just got lost again and now it comes back. And now uh, VR is very different. You have, we are in a digital age now. We are used to digital devices and communicate online that we haven't been used to that in the 90s. And of course, it's much more cheaper and more easy to use. So VR will definitely not go away again, but it will just grow, grow, grow. It maybe grows smaller than we all wish in the industry, but it definitely will grow. And um, personally, I wish that really more people would buy a VR headset like the Oculus Quest, which is really cheap compared to an iPhone, and you can do really many great things with it. But the problem still is that um, people, they do know why they should spend 1,000 euros on an iPhone, but they do not know why they should pay, uh, spend 400 euros on a, on a headset, you know. And as long as the people, as no one really is able to communicate this to the people, it will take longer and longer. And I think that platforms like Mozilla Hubs, you know, where you have, where you can easily create a virtual world and that you can easily access on the screen and on the headset, I hope this will be like a bridge helping also the VR industry because you know you can see such a such a world on the screen in Mozilla Hubs just how I just showed you but you really cannot compare this to the experience you will have once you put on the headset and see it there it's amazing and it's very different and I can just encourage you to do this and get your VR headset and try it out I'm sure you will love it <laughs> Great. And uh, continuing this question, um, there are uh, new features coming like each season maybe, like Oculus Quest have now this hand tracking thing. And uh, do you think this, that like VR art and how it develops is connected to this new technical features? Mm -hmm. And and do you, um, can you already tell that like hand tracking is used somehow in VR art and makes it different maybe? Yes, I know that some artists work on hand tracking for the quest especially, for example, also again, the Swan Collective and Bianca Kennedy with Animalia Zoom, they are working on a version uh, with the hand tracking. As far mm -hmm. as I know, maybe I'm wrong, but Felix, Bianca, tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure they do. So artists, of course, already work with that. And yes, artists definitely, they would adapt to everything. Also, once it's easier to have more persons in a VR experience, artists will like do it immediately. It's also just a question of money because it's still, for example, to create a multi-user experience, it's really expensive to do that. And most of the artists don't have that much money and it's so hard to get mm -hmm. all this funded anyway. So it may take a little longer for artists to adapt to these technologies just because of money, actually. But they yeah. are totally willing and keen to do so. Okay, but the, it's, a, it's a good interesting point uh, of, our, um, of this topic, how to get money, how to get funding for the VR art project? What, what are scenarios? How, uh, where to um, look for information about it? <laughs> right, so yeah, that's um, yeah, very complicated to get your art funded um, anyways. And usually most of the art funding, you know, in every country is funding for, uh, from the city, from the state, different grants. Uh, different open calls and they weren't so much open for digital art in the past years but this very much changed uh, with corona and in the past uh, month so that now it makes sense also you have better chances with uh, virtual reality or digital artworks in general and there are also yeah. special grants ex especially for these tool and, uh, tools and I think that's a really a big step and an important step that has been taking, taken now. And um, yeah, that's, that's really important. And also because obviously digital artworks and especially virtual reality artworks are not uh, easily to be sold. 
So um, even if you have one of the few galleries who would sell these artworks, also these galleries obviously have a hard time to sell these works to also to a price that would be would reflect the input mm -hmm. and the production costs the artists have. And that's not happening very often. There are also just a few collectors. But do you know such cases when galleries selling the VR art piece? Yeah, I know such cases. Very also, interesting. There is, for example, the Sabludovic collection in, um, in London, and they focus on buying and exhibiting VR artworks by artists. And that's, they are really great. They are really doing a great job. Yeah, and then as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, there is also a possibility for animation uh, works, for animating uh, animated uh, experiences to be presented and purchased by users like lots of times from this store platform. So do you know such cases maybe like when you get in or more or maybe the same amount of money that you put there to the project? Mm, uh, yeah, I, I don't know so much ex about specifically animations platforms, but there is one platform, it's called Kaleidoscope, um, yeah. where you can apply um, for funding for any kind of VR experiences. And I mean, I talked a lot about visual art specifically today because that's my field. But when it comes to animation, um, like film boards or film festivals or film funding is usually um, much more interested or interested in funding um, animations or more, more narrative um, storylines besides 360, mm -hmm. of course. So that's, um, that's a field to, to look into for sure if you're focused on creating anim animations. And uh, like since it's, it's also like maybe a subgenre of VR art when you have like animated story going around you or like a movie maybe, a 360 movie around you. Like, do you think it's it's okay to develop such an experience without like interaction features? Because in virtual reality, you can get all of this, but like, uh, is it working still if you're just doing the animation that goes around you? Yeah, totally. I mean, mm -hmm. not every work has to be interactive. Not all the works of the artists are interactive. And I also think there are just great 360 films uh, as a film film <laughs> with a narrative uh, in in VR. I love that too. It's just, um, yeah, it's just not uh, the field I'm working on uh, so much because I'm very focused on visual arts. But for sure, there are great ways. And there is, for example, an experience by Danny Levy uh, a filmmaker and the way how it's, I think it's called Jerusalem trilogy or so. Mm -hmm. And there he found a really great way to address the viewer, to address yourself in VR, in the film, which is just a 360 recording, but you can actually interact, but you really feel that the person is talking to you and interacting with you. So it's, there are really great ways to, to create films and also have, and also immerse the viewer, um, in the 360 content. Okay. Uh, and uh, do you think that uh, during the current time, the, during the coronavirus thing, uh, uh, what is happening with uh, virtual reality? What is happening with the genre? Is it uh, developing? Is it, uh, um, or it's stagnating somehow? Uh, yeah, I mean, kind of when Corona started, I was like, yeah, now everyone buys a VR headset. <laughs> I was hoping at least. But uh, I don't know how it is in other countries, but Germany is a very like backwards in terms of the digitalization. So it's, uh, we don't have so good internet. It could be better. The schools don't have internet. So actually in Germany, um, especially like the societal funds or the funds from the state go into the digital itself, not so much into virtual reality. So they basically, you know, now really build good infrastructure, have the schools to get computers and all these things, which is really a great step. Uh, but in terms of cultural funding, as I said, there are many new um, funds for um, digital art and also immersive art, AR, VR, and that's pretty new. That just happened now some months ago, and that's due to the coronavirus situation that the cultural funding in Germany finally acknowledges that 
they also have to focus on the digital and online content, obviously. And, you know, like with Mozilla Hubs, which is such a big platform, I just hope over time that this really helps to, yeah, to sell um, more VR headsets and get people interested in it. But yeah, just, it grows slowly. Um, it's fine. I can, I will wait and can wait. <laughs> Interesting. And see this growing. Yeah. Like some people could start with a, uh experiencing the virtual world from the desktop or mobile phone and then um, get a VR hat to, to, to go deeper. Because right. it, it's also fun when you can just move around if you're using the PC, but if you have a virtual reality headset, you have hands, you can yeah. like use gestures and stuff like that. So it's kind of fun. Yeah, it's um, much more intuitive, you know, you just move around like in a real world basically with yeah. the headset. Yeah. So, Tina, what is the current project you're working on? <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are many, so um, I will talk about two. Uh, one is the VR Art Prize by DKB in cooperation with CAA Berlin. It's the first VR Art Prize in uh, Germany for visual arts with a big uh, institutional exhibition that will take uh, place next February. And we just today, some hours ago, we published uh, five uh, finalists. Um, we had an open call and yeah, I'm really happy. You can look it up on the website. <laughs> we are, it's so hard to say, we are dot, uh, or just look at my Instagram, you will find it there, Tilissima. Oh, is it the uh, vrkunst.dkb.de? Uh, yes. Oh yeah, you can put it in chat, right? Yeah, I just added everyone? several links like ah, for perfect. Radiance, Spear to Space, Karagora. <laughs> ah, yes, you... that's the second project I'll introduce. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we just released five uh, VR artists as finalists. You can look this up on our website. And um, yeah, I will continue working with them from now on to February to create a wonderful real life exhibition of virtual reality. And I'm really, really excited for this. It's a really big step and really big step into structural funding of virtual reality art in mm. uh, Germany and in the cultural landscape of Germany. And I'm really, really proud to be part of this awesome project. So how, how it works, the art prize project, is it like uh, you're applying with an idea or you're uh, already applying with a f finalized project? Mm, you, you could apply with a work in progress, which has mm -hmm. to be finished by the end of the year. Mm. So some were, most of the works actually are work in progress and some are already finished, and, but we just recently finished. And then, of course, all the artists had to draft a, real, a physical installation with the VR piece. So, of course, we do not hang only the headsets in the space, but we will, as you saw in the shows I've been curating, we will create the spatial installations around the headset. Mm -hmm. And this is what we will be working on, especially in the next month to create the show and the installations. Yeah, we had an open call. We had 104 applications only by German VR artists. It's just for Germany. So, which is really a lot. <laughs> and yeah, no, um, the jury selected five. And yeah, let's get started. Okay. Yeah, and the second project, Nikita, I'm really happy <laughs> to introduce this in this context um, because um, uh, uh, there is, there was this grant, the European Cultural Fund, they uh, had an open call for a project that uh, deal with the cultural interaction or relation between different European countries, especially highlighting cooperations between Western and Eastern Europe. And uh, luckily Nikita and I uh, knew each other from before, from working together for a project for Radiance, a Radiance app that will hopefully release, uh, be released soon too. And uh, Nikita asked uh, me if we and some others, six curators, we are in total, want to apply for this funding. And so we did, and we are really happy to have uh, received the grant. And now we are developing our platform. It's called Kara Agora Center. It uh, also takes place on Mozilla Hub. So it's an online platform. And we are developing four different projects that will be published uh, in the next month. We will have events on this online center. So it will be really, really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Great, yeah. So I've shared all the links uh, we mentioned uh, in the comments below the YouTube video. So um, 
I do recommend to check everything. Like first, Radiance VR was a huge thing for me. It's like a kind of unique platform and database of VR art. There's no actually like analogs yet. Uh, and uh, it, it's great to see that also some works and from, from other countries, including Ukraine. It's, uh, it's very interesting to check all the new updates and posting there. So thank you so much for all the work you're doing. And uh, thank you for this lecture. It was very interesting. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks. Also, thanks again to Linoleum Fest for having me and to Goethe Institute for having me. It was really a pleasure. Thank you so much for your interest. Thank you, guys. Yes. See ya. See you. Bye.